professor there, did his training at Northwestern College, med school, residency, and then fellowship at Cleveland Clinic, right? Yeah. And uh, he's been instrumental in the Moon Group, and I think he's going to talk to us about some of that. The Moon Group has been going on for going on 20 years, I think. He was one of the founding members and has really helped to answer many of the, the basic <laughs> questions about ACL surgery, what fails, what works. Um, it's, it's been a very, very pivotal group. Um, and uh, he's now the executive director of the ACL study group. And um, also vice president of AOSSM. So we'll be inducted as president in a little over a year. We also have uh, another guest here, Bernie Bach, former president of AOSSM. Welcome, Bernie, from Rush. And Mark Miller is a current president of AOSSM. So you have three presidents of AOSSM in the room. Pretty special. So um, one other fun fact about Chris, uh, in addition to being an outstanding driver in the snow, I'll have to tell you about that story. Uh, he's climbed mountains on five different continents. Right? Yeah. Good. So welcome, Chris. David, thanks a lot. Yep. So thank you, David, for that uh, kind invitation. I mean, uh, introduction, and uh, I want to thank you and the department for the opportunity to speak. I'm honored to be here to speak, and um, I want to also, you know, recognize Mark Miller and Steve Brockmeyer and the rest of your sports medicine team here. You know, this is a pretty impressive lineup here. And uh, talk about being impressive. How about the University of Virginia, huh? UVA. So uh, the more I learn about it, the more impressed I am. And especially this guy. Okay. Oh, listen, my institution is a land grant institution. We're founded on cornfields. You guys are a world heritage site. The only university in the world that's a world heritage site. You're right there with the Taj Mahal and the great pyramids of Egypt. So that's, uh, that's impressive. And what also is impressive is this guy. I said, look at this guy, so holy cow, this guy, uh, he looks like an apex predator. You don't want to mess with this guy. So I was so impressed with him. I had to look it up. I said, what exactly is a cavalier? So I looked it up and Webster says he's a brave gentleman trained in arms. That's pretty cool. And this is what I've got. I've got a guy with a big head. <laughs> and I looked up, what exactly is a buckeye? And Webster says buckeye is a large, smooth, brown nut of no economic value. <laughs> That's what I'm dealing with. I mean, who would you want to go to prom with right here? Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's my, uh, my mascot envy. So uh, we're going to talk about moon, all right? So um, I don't have any conflict. So what information would you want to have if your child needed an ACL reconstruction? Would you want to know what the instrumental laxity is? Would you want to know what the Asconex strength is? How about the activity level at two years? How about the patient reported outcomes? The signs and symptoms of OA, risk of additional surgery, risk of graft failure, risk of contralateral ACL tear. Uh, how about their, how they're going to be doing in two, six, and 10 years? So I would propose that you'd want to know the predictors of three through nine. I'm not sure you really care as a parent about instrumental laxity. And I lived through the days where your KT1000 was the endpoint outcome and metric that we would use as surgeons to assess how good our ACL surgery was. Now you rarely hear that anymore. That's, we care about, three through nine, much more than we do about what, what a, uh, a half a millimeter of KT side to side difference. So these are prognosis and predictor questions, all right? And we all know the evidence-based medicine uh, uh, pyramid here, and we know that the increasing, the greater the strength of the evidence, the less frequent it is in the uh, literature. So why is there so little high quality clinical outcomes research in the literature? There are, hundreds of basic science journals that have thousands of high quality basic science research projects, right? That dwarfs high quality clinical outcomes research. You know, why is that? Well, which of these types of research are you gonna allow uh, to affect your or change your clinical practice? All right, right here, some kind of basic science bench research. Are you gonna let that affect your practice? Be extremely cautious of doing that. Something that left a big impression on me when I was early in my career, was Bob Johnson, a well-known uh, clinical researcher from the University of Vermont. He did some award-winning research using Hall Effect strange gauge transducers on the ACL. And he showed that when the knee goes into full extension, the ACL sees increased stress. 
the clinicians took that basic science research and we immediately applied it to our practice. We started putting our ACL reconstructed patients in these extension block casts, splints, braces. We wouldn't let them take the knee straight. We had these very, these 27 page long post-op protocols for rehab. We wouldn't, we'd okay, block them at 40. And then at two weeks, you can take them to 30. And sometimes we didn't let them get to full extension until four, six, eight weeks after surgery. Applying that award-winning basic science research to our clinical care created thousands of flexion contractors. There's people today walking around in, in, in the world with um, contracted knees because of that application. So be cautious about doing that. What about animal models? Well, perhaps. Another example over here is how many well done basic science studies are there looking at the pullout strength of an interference screw? There are a lot of those. How many clinical outcome studies show you whether the interference screw makes a difference on how your patient's doing long term? No, I'm not aware of any. So we need more outcomes research if we're going to change our clinical practice. An animal model, maybe you may change that, but this is where you want to be, right? This is what evidence medicine really is is clinical trials. And the issue is you can do a nice basic science project, high quality for a couple thousand dollars. You can do an animal study, nice quality animal study for tens of thousands. A well done, clinically impactful clinical trial can easily cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Very labor intensive, very expensive, not easy to do. Hence, you don't see as much of it in the literature. So a prospective cohort study is actually the best study designed for prognosis and predictors. The best study to look at efficacy of a uh, intervention is, of course, a randomized controlled trial. But if you're looking at prognosis and predictors, you want a well-done prospective cohort. If you want to delineate prognosis, you need a high-quality long-term follow-up. If you want to define predictors, you need large numbers. So what are the predictors? What are the potential predictors after an ACLR? Well, all of these have been proposed. They all have something. It's not an easy answer to... Um, to achieve, right? What are the predictors? And this list goes on and on. So if you're gonna to attempt to answer the predictors of outcomes after an ACLR, you need a database with large numbers so you can do statistical analysis. You need to standardize your assessments and your data collection. You need to validate outcome measures. You need to validate your intra and inter observer reliability of your independent variable assessment. Whoever's inputting the data, is, is it reproducible that the data being put in there is uh, valid? You need high quality uh, data points that are all completed. They're verified, they're secure, and they're retrievable. And you need a high capture rate. You need to capture a high percentage at enrollment to avoid selection bias. You need a high capture rate at follow-up to avoid detection uh, bias. These four characteristics, if you want these four characteristics in your study, it almost mandates that it's a prospective study, right? That's the weakness of retrospective studies. They can't hit those uh, qualities. So hence move. Moon's an acronym for Multicenter Orthopedics Outcomes Network. Here are the uh, founders, the six founders of Moon. We started in 2000. Um, we met down at Vanderbilt and we said, hey, let's start collecting ACL outcomes. We brought in a biostatistician from Vanderbilt and uh, he very begrudgingly came to our meeting. He says, why do I want to waste my time with a bunch of orthopedists? We said, well, look, we're going to do some impactful clinical work. And he goes, what are you going to measure? Well, we're going to do this, this, when you look at it. You look at meniscus tears, chondral damage. He looked around the room and goes, do you guys all agree? on what a meniscus tear is, how you grade it. So sure we do, we're all experienced knee surgeons. He says, show me some evidence. So we had to do an intra and intra observer liability on our assessment of meniscus tears. What about cartilage damage? Yeah, we all, do you guys agree? And he forced us to do a um, intra inter observer liability study on cartilage. We found out on grading the outer bridge, we all agree on a grade one and we agree on a grade four. We could not differentiate between a two and a three. We didn't have agreement between our group. So two and three just kind of lumps into one center. But anyway, it took two years of him beating us up before we actually started rolling patients because <clears throat> he really pushed us on doing quality data collection. I want to recognize Kurt Spindler. You know, he's been the heart and soul of the Moon Group. His passion and persistence was key to the success of the, uh, the Moon Group. So we ended up with a prospect cohort of over 3,500 ACL reconstructions followed up at two, six, and 10 years, we, uh, early on, we had a great 98% uh, capture rate. And our goal was always on a two and six year follow-up to have greater than 80% follow-up. Anyone in this room who's done follow-up, you know, it's easy to get 50, 60%. You make a little extra if you can get to 70. Getting over 80 is very challenging. To get to 90 on a large number of patients in tell society where people move is, is daunting. So here are the current members of uh, Moon. We've seen each site's added uh, members and you can see our uh, site support staff. So you can see the size of the Moon Initiative. So um, 
to establish validity, some of the things we talked about was the inter-relator agreement on meniscus tears and treatment, inter-relator agreement on particular cards classification, and then we had to do an intra and intersurgeon agreement on uh, where we put in our femoral and tibial tunnels just to um, satisfy some of these uh, statisticians. So at the time, we didn't think whether you used a hamstring or patella tendon mattered, but we did that too to show that um, what graph should we be using. So each site was required to have each surgeon complete their inter and intra reliability studies, uh, required a 97% capture rate up front. Each surgeon had to complete a 17 page data sheet. The patients did a 12 page form, and we pushed hard to have an 80% follow up at two, six, and 10 years. And really to make that happen, we pushed each other, did some peer pressure. The surgeons had to personally make phone calls on Sunday evenings. We call up the patient, hey, David, would you please fill out your form? No, this is important to us. This is pretty impactful. Da, da. And that's what put us over was the um, surgeons personally making those calls um, and to follow the moon uh, rehab guidelines. So um, you can see the first two years, our first thousand enrolled, very high uh, uh, upfront uh, capture rate. And then you can see at the two, six, 10 years, very pleased to be uh, over uh, 90%. 80%, I'm sorry. So what's the global hypothesis of Moon? Well, the global hypothesis was to evaluate the prognosis and predictors of clinically relevant outcomes of ACLRs. So our aim one was activity level, patient reported outcomes, science symptoms OA, recurrent ligament disruption, <clears throat> and then additional uh, surgery. So those are our five aims uh, that we pursued in, <clears throat> in our um, federal funding, our uh, NIH grants. So some of the questions, what's gonna be my future COOS after an ACL reconstruction. We can see the baseline right here of the five sub uh, categories of the, of the um, COOS. And you see at two, six and 10 years, the COOS has improved from baseline. And what's very impressive on this is that two, six and 10, it's very consistent. You can see the great biggest improvement was made in quality of life and sports and rec. The least amount of improvement was activity of daily living, which kind of makes sense in the ACL deficient knee or an unstable knee versus stable knee. You'd see the biggest change improvement here as opposed to here. So it improved and was stable through the last 10 years. What about my IKD, IKDC? Very similar. You see the uh, baseline and the two, six, and 10 years, very consistent over 10 years. Uh, so you can tell the patients, well, you have at two years, you very likely will have at 10 years. <clears throat> very encouraging. We're working on some grant funding to, to look at our 20-year follow-up. <clears throat> so is age a uh, risk factor for ACL reconstruction failure? Yes, uh, you have increased retairs in younger patients. Personally, I'd be this as a proxy because of return to level of activity. All right, I think young people are more active and have uh, exposed their graph to more high risk activities. It's not aging of itself, but the activity um, grading systems aren't um, sensitive enough. Uh, for example, if you play basketball once a week, you may say, well, that's a grade X on the grading system. But if you're my age playing over 40, over 50 basketball versus a college kid's playing basketball, you know, that activity level is not the same. Anyway, is gender a predictor of activity? Yes, females return to a lower level of Mark's activity after ACL reconstruction. Is baseline activity a predictor for post-op activity? Yes. The higher you active you are before the surgery, the more active you are after. How about BMI as a predictor? Yes. Higher BMI uh, at time of index surgery predicts lower activity and a worse patient reported outcome. Smoking, same thing. Smoking patients do return to a lower level of activity and have worse uh, patient education. Less educated patients predicts a worse outcome after an ACLR. How about a concomitant grade one or two MCL? You know, what, 60, 70% of acute ACLs have a grade one or two MCL? Does that predict outcome? No. How about a, a concomitant LCL injury? Yes. So you have more symptoms after reconstruction if that index injury you had some type of LCL injury. Medial meniscus repair, is that a risk factor for outcome? Yes. If you have a medial meniscus tear and you repair it, you have worse outcomes than if you've had no tear. Now, what's interesting about this is the lateral meniscus is, the, is uh, the opposite. A repaired lateral meniscus looks the same as the ACL that had no lateral meniscus tear. On the medial side, a repaired medial meniscus acts more like a meniscectomy than a no tear. <coughs> so. We can dig into that deeper, uh, but that's an interesting phenomenon. And other large uh, cohorts have shown the same thing, that the medial lateral menisci are not mirror images. They have different implications. Articular cartilage makes sense. If you have grade three or four lesions, you don't do it well. Um, how many uh, ACLRs return to American football, both at the college and high school levels, about 70%. Interesting in our study, uh, of those who didn't return, half of them cited fear of re-injury as one of the reasons they did not return to football. 
How about soccer? Same number. Uh, males a little more likely to return than females, but by 70% overall. And if you do a meniscus repair uh, in the moon group, the risk of failure for repeat surgery on the meniscus was about oh, five, 6% at two years. What about infection rate? Uh, less than a half of uh, a percent. Uh, diabetes significantly increased it by 18 or 19 fold increase in the odds ratio. And a teletendent autograph has significantly less chance of infection versus a hamstring or a um, allograph. So, how about is an ACL reconstruction as a primary treatment for the initial index ACL tear? Is it cost effective to society? And Mather's paper and AJSM showed yes. Early ACL reconstruction as opposed to doing non-operative treatment physical therapy if you fail, then doing the reconstruction. Doing the reconstruction early uh, increased to 0.3 quality of life years and it actually had lower cost, um, assuming that your failure rate uh, was under 17%. So from a societal point of view, early ACL reconstruction was more cost-effective than the pure preferred strategy as opposed to taking young people and have them uh, attempt a course of non-operative treatment. And then Warren Dunn showed the mean utility gain at six years after reconstruction was um, uh, 5.3 quality adjusted years, as opposed to someone who didn't have um, ACL surgery. So we can feel good about what we're doing. What about retear? So, okay, it's nine months out, you've done the ACL reconstruction, the knee looks good, the patient's happy, you're happy, uh, you're nine months out, you're about to release and let them do whatever they wanna do. Now, what are your concerns about that patient? Well, in my mind, I have two concerns. One, are they gonna retear the graft? And number two, long-term, are they going to get osteoarthritis? Get arthritis. So arthritis and retailers, to me, those are the big issues we wrestle with now as ACL surgeons. So let's talk about uh, um, retailers. One of the first studies we did looking at uh, independent predictors of uh, retail was this study I was involved in. Our primary objective was to um, evaluate the risk of re-rupture for tibialis allograft versus a hamstring autograft. And our secondary was to identify associated variables that predict graft retear. So we're looking at auto versus allo and how do they do? And this is the first study that showed that the allografts don't do well. So a prospective evaluation of tibialis allograft versus hamstring autograft had minimum two year follow-up. Single surgeon, single surgical technique. We use a soft tissue ACL reconstruction technique for both the grafts, identical rehabilitation afterwards and identical return to play guidelines. So we did all we could to try to minimize as many confounders as possible. So uh, at um, 166 um, allografts, 123 um, autos, 85% follow-up for two years. Uh, did logistic regression. Uh, you can see right away here that you know, um, aloes looked very suspicious. We had nine additional variables uh, that we uh, assessed. So again, this is one of the first studies we did. Right away, you can just see allografts didn't look so good. And we start looking at the summary statistics. And this surprised me. Angela Pedroza, who's our outcomes uh, director, I uh, asked her, gee, how much increased risk did the females have? Obviously, we all know females have increased risk for tearing the native ACL. I assumed that they must have an increased risk for tearing a reconstructed ACL. And she goes, oh, no, there was no difference. I said, no, you must be underpowered. There must be something there. What are you talking about? And she showed me the graphs and they laid exactly on top of each other. And Spindler uh, teased me this day because I, I said, um, Angela, your data is interfering with my opinion. So, um, uh, and everyone else has shown the same thing, that the, the, once you've had an ACL reconstruction, that knee has a certain risk and the gender does no longer uh, apply. So and now if you look at the... Um, continuous data, such as age and mark score, and you, you kind of um, do it by quartiles, clearly younger age and higher marks, you can see that the risk is younger age and higher marks. Um, our rock curve showed at, at 0.85, there was very strong predictive value of our model. So the odds ratio, if you isolate marks and you control for age and graph type, for each increase in four points on the marks activity score, the odds of retiring is increased by threefold. And the odds ratio by age, when you control for marks and graph type, for every increase in 10 years of age, the odds of retear dropped in half. Or conversely, for every age or every 10 years you're older, um, I'm sorry, every 10 years you're younger, you double your risk. What's interesting, when we came out with this, it was like months later that Don Shelbourne published that his teenagers had twice the retail rate of his 20 year, um, those in their 20s, and those in their 20s had twice the retail rate of those in his 30s. So it showed the same thing that um, every decade of life, uh, you drop your risk of retear in half. So age is a strong predictor of retear. And again, is it age in of itself or is it activity level? And age is a proxy for activity. I personally think age is a proxy um, for uh, activity. So uh, graph type, 
you control for age and activity, uh, roughly in this particular um, cohort, it was a five-fold increase if you had an, um, an allograft. So this is our final model or clinical vignette. An 18-year-old was running, cutting, decelerating, pivoting over four times a week and had an allograft. In this cohort, had a 20% chance of retear. Young patient, high activity, allograft. Same patient with autograft, it drops all the way to 6%. Um, how about a 40-year-old who does running, cutting, pivoting only once a month? He has less than 1% chance of retiring. You put an allograft in him, it's still just under 3%. So all of a sudden the allograft doesn't look so bad, right? So we're going to talk more about you just can't make your decision making on a single variable, or even two. It's a multivariable analysis uh, that we need to do for our, our making recommendations to our patients. <clears throat> so this graph you can see quite a bit of. This came, graph came out of that very first study, the one I just referenced. And you're looking at risk of retail, you're looking to age and graft, a graph type. So you can see here's younger age. As you get older, your retail rate drops. The solid line is um, allograft, the dotted line is um, autograft. So you can see in younger patients, the autograft is dramatically uh, has lower retail risk than the um, um, allograft. We're going to come back and you see that graph more. So conclusions were high level activity increases the chance of retail, allograft increases the risk, increased uh, age decreases the risk of retail, and gender was not a risk factor. So Carolyn Hetrick took uh, some of our moon data, looked at subsequent surgery uh, two and six years after um, reconstruction. And I'll jump to the uh, retail data here. This was interesting on the ipsilateral subsequent surgery, revision, meaning you tore your graft. In the first two years, two thirds of the tears occurred in the first two years and roughly a third occurred in the subsequent four years. All right, so the retears, if you're gonna retear, this kind of applies, you're gonna retear early. Median time to retear was 17 months. Contralateral primary ACL reconstruction, that means you tore your other you know, native ACL, almost the reverse. Almost two thirds of those who are in the second uh, four year period, not the initial two year period. And average time was 27 months. So, summary ipsilateral tear more likely to occur early, contralateral tear more likely to occur later. So, you'll see these different studies. People say, oh, the uh, ipsilateral tear, was, we were more likely to tear your other knee, or you had equal chance of tearing both after ACL surgery, or you're more likely to re tear your graft. You, you, so, you hear different results from different studies. Well, it depends how long they follow them out. The longer you follow them out, the more you can see contralateral tears. If you only follow them for a year, year and a half, or only follow them for two years, yeah, you're gonna say it's the ipsilateral that tears. The more you follow them, all of a sudden the contralateral becomes relevant. So again, when someone presents outcomes data, you have to understand more of it because the uh, confounders like length of follow-up always come into play. So um, we followed up with that doing a study looking at time to failure. Uh, after reconstruction. So rates of cell graft retear in the literature have been reported anywhere from zero to 30%. So uh, we all know the risk factors for retears, um, but very little work has been done looking at the time to failure. So we put together a study using kaplan meyer survival curves, uh, looked at a cohort of ACL failures in the moon group, uh, but we were not looking for risk or rate of failure, but timing of failure. Every patient in this uh, study had failed at retour. So in grass that fail, when do they fail? What influences time to failure? So we need a large number of fa um, graph failures, et cetera. We ended up with 116 um, first-time revisions that all, had all the data points that we wanted in this particular study. So uh, in the entire cohort, the median time to failure was 22 months. And activity was the greatest predictor or had the greatest influence on time to failure. So if you dichotomize the marks, and you took the patients and took them to low activity or high activity, meaning a low activity is marks under 12, high activity is marks of 12 or higher, all of a sudden you start to see a big difference. Look at that. So the low activity patients, their median time to failure was over four years, where the high activity patients, they tore theirs in less than two years, 17 months. This was highly statistically, statistically significant. So here's the um, um, Meyer Kaplan survival curve. You can see that the um, there we go. So the low marks, 50% of those failures in the low marks group had occurred by 51 months, and then the high activities at 17 months. So activity, a strong uh, predictor. So we put in gender. Do the uh, males and females, if they're going to tear, do they tear at the same time? This graph would say yes. But 
we didn't take into account activity, right? We just said activity is the biggest predictor. So when someone presents, what I said a few minutes ago, if someone presents an outcome, especially after any intervention, but after they see every construction, if they don't control for confounders, and a huge confounder that's not shown in this is activity. So when you now take survival by gender and put in low and high activity, look what we get. In the low activities uh, group, the male and females, time to failure is the same. But in high activity, it reached statistical significance that the females, half of those tore at 12 months. They tore early. And the males tore at two years. So they both tore roughly within two years, but the females tore sooner. So that's just an example. As you add more, as you control for more confounders, your results start to change. What about graph type, auto versus allo? Again, data interference, with my opinion. I would have said, oh, the allo graphs, will well, they must fail earlier. It's a dead piece of tissue. They don't bioincorporate. Nothing, nothing, uh, no difference. So I was wrong on that. Okay, let's, what, what's the biggest uh, um, confounder? Activity. So let's put in activity. Low activity, high activity, no difference. So autos and allos, they fail at the same time. What about patella tendon versus hamstring? No difference. What about low activity, high activity? No difference. So overall, one half of all graphs fail by you know, 22 months, the first year, first two years. Neutral factors, auto versus allo, patella tendon versus hamstring had no influence on time to failure. Activity had the highest influence you see here and females had a shorter time to failure in the high activity group. So <clears throat> when you start to think about this particular study, what came to mind is, I think we need to do a better job at evaluating when and how quickly our post-op patients return to what level of activity. That's not been controlled well. No, Moon didn't do a great job of that either. Uh, and I think that's important for us to know. Because you start looking at this and you start thinking things like, gee, is there a period of risk after the ACL reconstruction? We shouldn't let them go. They look good, they're ready to go. The physical therapist says they're good to go, but maybe they shouldn't go. And we're gonna talk more about that here in a little bit. Or does um, early high activity simply increase the uh, risk exposure rate, which I think is probably the answer, but I've been wrong before. So we just said that autographs are the best graphs for young people, right? We saw that graph where the younger you are, the bigger the difference between um, auto and allographs. But among the autographs, what's the best graph for high school and college age athletes? All right, there's our curve. And so we're interested in this area right here, 14 to 20 year olds. So we're gonna dig down a little deeper in here. We're gonna focus on athletes, try to control all we could for all the confounders and <clears throat> have six year follow-up. So we want to identify the um, <clears throat> incidence of subsequent ACL injury in high school, college athletes in patella tendon versus hamstring autographs. Um, so we had uh, 840 enrolled, 19 percent follow-up six years. Inclusion criteria, they had to be 14 to 22, the ACL had to be tear, torn in a sporting activity. So we got even more narrow, not just young patients, but young athletes. If they uh, tore their ACL falling off a ladder, they weren't in the study. So they had to tear it in a sporting activity. They had to have a primary reconstruction of the hamstring or autograph, and they had, had to have normal contralateral knees. So uh, we did uh, multivariable regression analysis to control for all these confounders. <clears throat> and the single biggest predictor for ACL graft failure in that group was having high pre-op laxity. So generalized laxity and a big, you know, explosive pivot shift. Uh, right behind it was hamstring versus patella tendon. And age was also one of the top uh, predictors, which is interesting because, I right, gotta hit the right button here. Well, even in this narrow group, so this age group is only eight years, right? 14 to 22. Even within this narrow range of 14 to 20 year olds, age matter, statistically significant, that the younger ones, the 14, 15, 16 year olds had a higher risk than the 20, 21, 22. So that tells you how powerful a predictor age is, even a very narrow range, it was still statistically significant. So um, <clears throat> we took this graft where we, from our first study and what happened, that graph turned into this graph. So the um, autographs, the black is the patella tendon and the green is the hamstring. So you can see in the young group, the um, uh, patella tendon autographs the best, and then the allograft is up here. So <clears throat> clearly the strongest predictor on the contralateral side in this group was the sport that they returned to play. If you did not return to basketball, football, or soccer, the risk of tearing a contralateral ACL injury dropped by two thirds. 
So I believe that that dovetails with everything else we said about activity. In fact, I tell my patients um, today, uh, when we're getting ready to release them, I tell them, if you, if your number one priority in life is to never, ever, 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 ever tear another ACL, either your reconstructed ACL or your contralateral ACL, it's pretty easy. Do not play any of the big five. Do not play soccer, football, basketball, rugby, or lacrosse. You just by doing that, you'll drop your retail risk by two thirds. <clears throat> okay, so how about using some kind of risk calculator for ACL decision making? So uh, we just talked about his autograph choice influence um, ACL injury. Yes, but it's clearly not the only risk factor. We talked about all the different risk factors. To get the best estimate on subsequent ACL risk, you have to use some type of multifactorial risk calculator because single variable analysis is inadequate. All right, look at this. So you have to account for all the significant predictors. So here's a perfect example. If you're trying to talk about what kind of graft to put in the knee, you can say, well, um, allografts have a higher retail rate, so I'm not going to use it. So that's a single factor analysis, just start looking at what kind of um, graft you're going to use. But if you just add a simple, a second um, factor such as age, you quickly, by looking at this, the difference between auto and allo, once you hit 35 or 40, that difference is not clinically significant. So now all of a sudden, auto versus allo, just blithely saying an allograft's not any good, or no, in an older patient, it's fine. And you can say the same thing for in the autographs, patellar tendon versus hamstring, once you hit about age 25, this difference is no longer clinically significant. But in your teenage group, active cutting sport, you probably should do a patellar tendon. But as soon as they hit, graduate from college and in their uh, mid twenties, again, that doesn't make a difference. So again, just by adding that second factor of age to graph choice, now all of a sudden our recommendations to the patients change. So if you have zero factors or, or uh, start with just one, you know, you can tell your, you tell your patient your retail rate after an ACL uh, tear is 8%. And I hear this type of thing in, in, at meetings all the time. They throw out one number, but they, it's, a, it's a, in this particular slide, I have it zero, but I'd say it's a single factor analysis. I, I'm not sure that means anything to me because if I add a single additional factor of age, now all of a sudden that 8% turns into 15 for those under 20 and drops to four for those over 40. So is telling your patient their retail rate eight, is that a fair thing to say when you don't take into account their age? I'm going to say no. What if you add uh, whether they're high laxity or low laxity? And what if you add a graft type, auto versus allo? Now all of a sudden that 8% number <clears throat> for a low, uh, young, high active patient with high laxity with an allograft, they've got a 40% chance of retearing. And a older patient with low laxity has less than 1%. So now all of a sudden that 8% looks less and less you know, honest and legit because you haven't taken enough factors in. And that's only looking at what? Three different factors. What about activity level of return to and tibial slope? Those are risk factors as well. And what about adding um, return to play time, which has not been, I think, adequately analyzed. Now people start to look at it. Rehab client smoking, BMI. And what about surgical technique? So these are all factors that could change that number. So just saying 8%, I, I think is, is not uh, legit. So how do you start to do a multifactorial risk analysis? Well, you can use a nomogram. You guys have all seen those at some point, right? I'm, maybe I'm too old for that, but uh, you take these. Here's one for six years using looking at seven predictors, and here's one at six years for the contralateral native ACL tear uh, with seven predictors. And here's an example of a 14-year-old female basketball player. You know, um, uh, with low laxity, you can just see how uh, patellar graphers, hamstring graph. You draw your lines here, add up your points, take your points, put them down here, and you get a uh, risk. So very accurate, very uh, statistically um, robust but carrying around a bunch of these sheets and with your ruler and sitting all this, you know, uh, I'm not sure many orthopedists are going to do it. So we know that single variable analysis is inadequate when reporting uh, ACL graft retail risk. <clears throat> Normograms, we just showed, they're very effective, but they're very inconvenient. They're tedious, they're time-consuming, not readily available. I can't see anybody in this room walking around filling out nomograms in the office when the parent asks you, what's the retail risk for my, uh, my child? So can we somehow automate this nomogram type of analysis into a risk calculator you can put on your phone? Well, finds out you can. So Moon worked with Cleveland Clinic. We developed the uh, Moon Knee uh, Risk Calculator. And here you can see me actually using it. So this is a 20-year-old female who plays soccer uh, four times a, uh, a week. You see I'm punching in um, height and weight, which gives the BMI. Put in the gender. Punching this in, I'm putting in her marked activity here. What sport played, how often she runs. 
And you can see this is going to come out with a retail risk in um, green, yellow, and red. Calculate your risk. So you punch it here. So until 10% hamstring, if normal laxity was 2.5% versus 5%, if you're high grade laxity, all of a sudden the hamstring jumped to 12% versus 5%. So the red means, ooh, this particular graft is significantly different than the other graft. So maybe you shouldn't use the red. But you see normal laxity, uh, do you care? Is this enough difference to change your clinical practice, 2.5% versus 5.5%? Maybe. But you saw below 5% and 12%, and yeah, that probably would change your practice. So this can be done. Um, uh, so the risk calculator makes the normal gram analysis quick and easy. It can be web-based, easy, quick access, takes less than a minute to do it. So what are we going to do with this? Well, I think it's actually a pretty valuable tool. And the more you think about it and use it, the more excited you get about it. But we need to continue to expand the quality and the number of risk factors you put into this thing. Because quite frankly, it makes the uh, recommendation more accurate, right? I showed you how one, two, or versus three factors taken into it really uh, gets granular on what the risk is. So when you start getting into eight, nine, or 10 factors, the normogram gets very unwieldy. So um, computerizing it on something that's web-based on your phone would be great. So we also need to create risk factor, uh, risk calculators, not only for retail rates, but for patient reported outcomes and post-traumatic OA. So, um, so Mark, you know, as you know, this is some, this is what Kurt's been pushing. So we need to look into that. I think it's a, it's a very um, commendable uh, project, but we got to think who's going to spend the time and money to make that happen, but we need to do it. <clears throat> so how long after an ACL reconstruction before you return to play? All right, so what are your concerns, all right? You're sitting there with your patient, your 17-year-old high school soccer player, knee looks good, about to release him to play. Well, your concerns are, are they gonna be able to perform, right? Are they, they got an atrophied leg, et cetera? Uh, what's their retail risk? And are they gonna get long-term uh, OA? So you need to do some more work. Um, is time a concern? Five months versus eight months versus 10 months, two years? Um, is there a period of risk? What about neuromuscular function? What about associated injuries? Do they have a meniscus condyl damage? Do they have some uh, uh, one of the sides, lateral medial MCL injuries? What about genetic risk factors, uh, tibial slope, um, uh, family history? What about biologic measures? Well, or some combination of the above. We have, in the last 10 years, really focused on this neuromuscular, right? All the physical therapists are talking about these neuromuscular milestones. Have they hit them before? <clears throat> you should release the knee cell reconstructing knee back to play sports. So we've hit this pretty hard. But what we've not looked at is the biologic measure. So we were thinking about, you know, geez, you know, this, uh, we are biologic creatures. This is something that needs to be looked at that. So we, uh, we have a very innovative uh, imaging group at Ohio State, and we, uh, I talked to them about to, uh, being able to do a PET MRI. How can we measure the metabolic activity of ACL graft? So um, for the PETs, you guys know the patient's injected with this um, fluorodeoxy um, um, glucose. It's taken up by cells per metabolic activity. The higher, more activity, the more it's taken up. They quantify it by what's called the standardized uptake value, which is ratio of the target uptake to the whole body background uptake. Um, and you can see that you can get some nice imaging of where metabolic activity is going. So you're not really looking at structure, you're looking about metabolic activity, uh, very commonly you know, used in cancer. So using some of the state, the art, we're able to get the, um, uh, the radiation dose from the PET scan to one fourth to one fifth, and now down to one tenth the standard radiation dose. So it's becoming a, a much, much more safe procedure to do. So here you can see the, um, the PET MRIs, the, the PET's on the left, the MRI in the middle, and the PET MR is on the right. So you can see where you can focus on different um, um, tissue locations and you can develop your uh, SUV, your quantification of it. So here's the end chart here. Very interesting here. So you can see the blue, red, and green, proximal, mid, and distal ACL graft, and then as a uh, comparative background to muscle. So you can see the muscles all at uh, 0.5. And you can see the ACL graft, pretty consistent. It doesn't return to normal until two years. So it takes two years for your ACL graft to get baseline metabolic activity. So this can grow some other basic science work. Scott Dye showed that bone scans don't return to normal until two years. Uh, a lot of the neuromuscular uh, studies that really these exercise phys guys really dialing down. Um, it takes 18 months to two years to really get that to return. And I've noticed early on, my athletes, often it seems it's the second season they go back that they say, doc, I'm really back. The first season I was okay, but the second season, my knee really feels good. So that all kind of dovetails together. So look at this. Remember we talked about Caroline Hetrix and some of the other data we do about 
the ipsilateral tearing early and the contralateral tearing late. And all of a sudden it jumped out at me. Well, look at here, the ipsilateral, two thirds of the ipsilateral for within two years, it takes two years for that graph to get the normal. Is there some correlation there? Um, once the graphs matured and gets past two years, the risk of retear drops. Is that because of this biologic situation or is there other factors involved? But it makes you scratch your head and think a little bit. And then after two years, you're more likely to tear your contralateral ACL. So is there a biologic consideration on return to play risk that we're not taking into consideration? Now, this is another um, unexpected finding from the study. You can see the baseline is a 0.5, and that if I go back to the other slide, the ACL reconstruction quadrupled that, went up to the two and two and a half range. The contralateral native ACL, normal knee, doing this PETMR study, it had increased activity. It just doubled, it didn't go up where the, uh, the graft was, but the, the contralateral native ACL, and it returned to normal in two years. So the other, other knee, the quote unquote normal knee, had increased metabolic activity. Was it seeing more load? Were the patients putting more load on the, on the uh, uh, normal knee because they were protecting the post-op knee? Hard to say. But the fact that injury to one knee affects the other knee, you know, that's been shown by several studies, Bruce Ryder in this study, contralateral knees impaired. And uh, we've seen a lot in the neuromuscular side how one injury on one side affects the other. So what are the questions? What's the time frame for uh, graft ligamentization? Does this vary by graft type? Does this vary by gender or age? What's the standard deviation of this process? Do we need to do uh, PET MRs on every patient because the standard deviation is so wide or is it pretty tight? And once we've done our study um, cohort, we can then apply that data to the general population, not have to PET scan them. Um, what are the clinical implications of this process on returning to play and risk retear? These are all unknown questions. That's for you young people to sort out here. So uh, when we talk about return to play timing considerations, our joint biologic conditions a factor? That's something we normally, historically, the last 10, 20 years haven't thought of. And if so, which joint measures are best predictors of the desired outcome? We need to dig down deeper into this. So I have this interest in how do we quantify on an MR joint health? That's another talk. So we're doing all this effort on outcomes measures, right? We're doing all this work. Is it making any difference? You know, are, we, are we making an impact? Is there a change in practice patterns after we do an analysis of these risk factors and are we resulting in some kind of improvement and our ACL reconstruction outcomes. So we did this little study. So remember we met in 2000, we started collecting patients in 2002. So we have the 2002 cohort. And so that 2000, by the end of 2003, then the two year follow-ups 2005. So in 2006, early 2006, we're doing the early analysis of the early group. And then we shared this analysis in late 2006 with the moon surgeons. And then we did analysis of after uh, the, we shared it in late 26, the 2708 cohort had to wait two years. And with, so the question is, were the results of the um, later cohort different than the early cohort because of the analysis that was shared with the surgeons? We didn't tell them what we shared with them was this. We showed them this graph, how the younger patients, the allografts have a higher retail rate. We didn't tell them, oh, you shouldn't do this, do that. We just shared the data with them. In fact, we're still kind of sorting through it. I shared the data. And sure enough, the late cohort, you can see that the average age for the hamstrings went down by two, but the average age of the allografts went up by eight. So the moon group was putting allografts in a much older population. And the um, activity, they were putting the allografts in less active patients. And the odds of retear, you can see for the a hamstring patella tendon were no different, but between the early group and late group, the retail rate for the allografts dropped significantly. So when you look at the demographics of the early group and the uh, late group, the only thing that was different was that the allograft risk dropped from 11% to 3%. All the other demographics that potentially could be risk factors like age and marks did not change between the two groups. So that was pretty reassuring that um, by, When we share the information to surgeons, they change the allograft to older patients and less active patients. And the only risk factor change is what I just talked about. So our conclusion was that when shown credible evidence outcome predictors, surgeons actually change their practice patterns and it did result in improved patient outcomes. So that was reassuring that all this work we're doing actually uh, makes a difference. 
All right, so we've been talking about the moon group. So the moon group is a prospective cohort. You also, you know, you go to these meetings hearing about ACL outcomes, you'll hear a lot about these national registries, the, the Swedish registry, the uh, um, uh, New Zealand registry, the Brits have a registry now. And it makes you think, well, what's the difference between uh, a registry and a, and a cohort? You know, look at, you have, um, both are prospective observational studies assessing outcomes after ACL, all right? So the moon group and these national registries, yet we instinctively sense there's something different about these, right? A national registry and the moon group, that, yeah, they're out, prospective outcome, uh, there's something different there. So what that difference is, is this concept of efficacy and effectiveness, all right? Efficacy is the capacity to produce an effect. Eff effectiveness, is performance under real life conditions. I will right, we'll explain that a little bit more. Seat belts may be shown to be efficacious in the lab, but if no one wears them, they will not be effective in the real world. So uh, Nancy Stark, a PhD in um, uh, public health, says efficacy refers to how well a device performs in a setting of carefully selected patients in a carefully controlled protocol. Efficacy is measured in clinical studies. You're controlling the confounders. Effectiveness refers to how well a device performs as intended in the general population of patients in the general chaos of clinical practice, the real world, like my seatbelt example. That's the difference between efficacy and effectiveness. Effectiveness is measured in registry studies. Efficacy is measured in clinical studies. They feed each other. One is not better than the other. One, they, they support each other. So both for value, one doesn't include the need for the other. In our seatbelt example, uh, without the controlled efficacy study, one may conclude that from the effectiveness studies, the seatbelts don't work. We know it didn't work as no one warm. But if you didn't do the efficacy study, you'd say, well, why even put seatbelts in? They clearly don't work. Well, you have to sort out why. So if there's a discrepancy between the two types of studies, an inquiry into why is indicated, and they can answer each other's questions. If a controlled study, same thing, rewording we just said, um, Whoa, 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 getting ahead of myself. If a control study shows an intervention is not effective, but a registry shows it is not, an intervention why is needed. This may reveal a correctable, non correctable problem in the general application of the interventions applied. So, conversely, if a registry shows an intervention to be effective, but it's unclear why it's effective, then a controlled clinical efficacy study can provide this answer. So, that's how the two of them can fulfill each other's um, um, weak spots. So what are the advantages of Moon? Well, Moon has a clearly focused research question, has five clearly defined aims, and it was preemptively powered to answer those five um, aims. We had other people asked to join a Moon after we got going, but we realized if you add more sites, we start to add to the complexity of making Moon effective, but we don't need the numbers to answer our research question. So we defined, we powered our study, and we were very um, disciplined at staying. This is the size we want to be. If you get too big, you have issues. So we had excellent front end capture rate. We had excellent follow up capture rate. We had vested interested surgeons. We have more expensive data capture per patient. We had enhanced follow up, over 80% follow up, and we had high quality data collection. So it was, at the time, it was as controlled as we could make it with very few confounders. So these are the advantages of Moon. And we had a reliability of the surgeon assessments. Um, so unlike registries, we felt very good that each surgeon putting in the data was doing it in a uh, reproducible way. This advance of Moon may not be generalizable, right? These are all uh, committed academic knee surgeons. You know, is this going to be applicable to the general population? And our large our numbers were not that huge, you know, three and a half thousand uh, for more detailed analysis. So what are the advantages of a national registry? You know, you look at some of these registries, they have tens of thousands of patients. So they have very large uh, numbers. Uh, it's obviously more generalizable, right? It's what's happening in the real world. Um, and they have more variables to analyze, but the data is not as clean. It's, uh, you know, they have a lot of empty spots and the, the surgeons are supposed to be, you know, voluntarily put this data in. They may not be doing a very good job of inputting the data. So disadvantages of a national registry is the follow-up's a challenge, um, and less commitment by the operating surgeon to complete the forms. Uh, they have a less controlled patient experience uh, surgeon experience, hospital setting, post-op uh, rehab, a poor control of confounders. A perfect example of that was the Swedish registry showed that quad tendons have a higher retail rate than patella tendon. All the other studies were showing they were equal. 
and the, and the Swedish registry set showed this. And it, because it was so uh, flew in the face of the rest of the data, the Swedes looked a little deeper and they found out, first of all, there weren't a whole lot of quad tens being done. And the reason the quad tens had a retail rate was the retail rate was very, very high at the low volume, inexperienced surgeon hospitals. So they dug a little deeper, they realized, oh, um, in the more experienced centers, they had the same retail rate as potential attendance, but the inexperienced surgeons had a high retail rate. They were only doing two or three of them, two or three of them tour, and they stopped doing it, but they had a high retail rate. So just uh, that's a perfect example of they, they weren't controlling for confounders. All right, so in summary, uh, prospective cohorts and registries are complementary entities. One smaller, more focused, and controlled with excellent follow-up. The other is larger, more generalizable, and has potential for a deeper analysis. They're both expensive. They're both labor intensive. They both can be very powerfully clinically relevant research tools. They need to be both carefully purposed, carefully designed, and carefully executed because it takes a lot of resources to uh, put them in place. So we need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of both. They're an apple and orange. Understand and appreciate the value and weakness of each. All right. So that's the end of my moon presentation. Questions on all that? Yeah. We hit a lot of data there. Yes. Go ahead. I'll start. So you talk about the uh, high retail rate in the young patients. How do you balance that with the risk of meniscal injury if you don't? So you're asking how we balance the um, high rate of retail in young patients, but if you don't do the reconstruction, you put an increased risk of tearing their meniscus, right? Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to see what the other surgeons say. Some you know, of this often reported in, in meetings is the return to play rate after the ACL reconstruction. And they say, oh, our return to play rate was only 60%, 50%, 80%. And they act like we have to do better there. We got to get them back to 100%. I'm not so sure that's true. If my 13 or 14 year old daughter loved to play soccer and she tore her ACL, what is the best recommendation I can make to her? For her long term health of that knee. Next time we have four years. Bingo. The best thing for that knee is to have a well done ACL reconstruction done, do the rehab, and do not go back to play soccer. That's the best thing for that knee. You stabilize it to protect the meniscus and the cartilage, but not going back to soccer, you've protected her because the fact that she tore it, if it's a in, if it's a non-contact injury, if it's a contact injury, it's not quite as true, but if it's a non-contact injury, which is 70% of these are, she's declared herself to be a high risk individual. The fact that she'll re tear it on the contrary are pretty high. So, not going back to place by the best thing for it. Now, that's not the most popular thing to say, but I think it's the truth. Uh, uh, yeah, very interesting presentation. I think grabbing all the data is obviously very uh, labor intensive, as you mentioned. Um, when you look at things like risk factors, you, you went through some slides where you talked about smoking's risk factor, and you, know, you went through it through. Are those things quantified or is it yes or no, smoker or not smoker? Or do you, do you get stratified? Stratified as far as you know, some of them smoke can be as a sort of more of a yes, no thing. But some of the things you did could be a variable, could be a linear variable, but there could be some risk that you do more of a particular thing, there's more risk. Or is it just doing that particular thing puts you in a So um, he's asking on some of these um, continuous variables like smoking, is it a yes, no? Do we make it a uh, categorical yes, no? Do you make it continuous? You're a heavy smoker, light smoker. You can smoke it for one year, but smoke for 30 years. Uh, I think we've made it a yes, no, because it makes the analysis easier. And you need the more right. you know, those different variables continuous, that would be even bigger numbers. So now the demand on your data collection is going up. So you, you walk that line of trying to make your analysis uh, doable versus the strength of the right. collusion is a very great fellow. Bernie, Chris, and, and that was a wonderful compilation of tremendous efforts by the yeah, Moon Group. Um, so when you, your follow-up, is that a telephone follow-up at two, six, and 10 years? Yeah, so it's, it's all subjective. We do have a nested cohort that we bring back for on-site, but it's a small subset. That's a criticism of Moon is that if we don't do an objective eval, but we, we addressed that a few years ago by having a smaller group that's uh, brought back and they have a physical exam and a uh, x-ray and an MRI. Yeah, because if, if you try and, these patients are younger and they're all over the place and 
we had one study that we published in 97 where we actually went to 10 different states to personally evaluate <coughs> post-operatively two to five years, five to nine years. And um, I mean, it's just impossible. These clinical studies are so difficult to do. So I don't know if you heard Bernie, he's talking about how difficult it is to get, you know, eight, nine, 10 year follow-up and how mobile our society is. And you're right. So uh, a lot of this was based on the first blush was done by these um, uh, college medical students out of Vanderbilt, with Curtis at Vanderbilt. And we incentivized, these are very tech savvy, you know, medical students, undergrads, find these people. They're doing social media. They're going all over the place trying to find, you know, Jimmy, Bob, and a self instruction promised by Dr. Kading eight years ago, 10 years ago. How do we find them? And, and there's a certain percentage, like Kurt would say, I don't know how the IRS finds these people. They, you can't find them. They're just gone. <laughs> Maybe they're dead or buried with Jimmy Hoffman or something. It's very difficult to yeah, The other question I had was in, in terms of the um, allograft selected, that was just with tibialis anterior? It, it is always. So um, Bernie's asking about the allograft, the allograft analysis. Was that all tibialis anterior? And then, so Bernie, you hit it. All this data, in fact, there's your comment too on, on like smoking. Do we dig deeper into smoking? That data, that what the first study I showed that sort of allograft were bad, that was all tibialis allograft. What does, does that mean a allotendin allograft is the same? No, we need to look into that. What about an Achilles allograft? But what about a processed allograft versus non-processed allograft? Mm -hmm. Well, subsequent with that study, um, a lot of studies are showing that a fresh frozen, a non-processed allograft, the retail rate's nowhere nearly as bad. The more processed it is by some industry proprietary process, the more likely it is to retail. But you're right. You always you always dig down deeper, and that's my that's my point on um, these risk calculators. As the data set in the next 10, 20 years continues to grow, how do we compile that to a number that you actually the exam room tell the parent this is risky? You're going to have to have some. I mean, the real message for the audience is that an allograft probably is not a good choice in a very active younger individual. But I spent the last 20 years, 50% of my practice, teaching the allograft based on their age and activity level. And we just submitted our 35 year, my 35 year experience and the personal revision rates, whatever that, whatever that means. But, but the personal revision uh, uh, rates for a and BTV autograph was 1.6% for a BTV allograph at 2.4% with uh, the follow up takes 17 years. So, Bernie's just talking about um, a well-selected um, allograft, which is not processed in a older patient, 35, 40, whose low activity is an appropriate thing to do. And he's looking at his long-term follow-up and his autographs had a return rate of one and a half and his allografts were two and a half. Now, some people would say, your allografts have twice the failure rate, but that you hear that too. Well, that, that's not fair either because the clinical significance of one and a half versus two and a half versus the benefit of not having harvest. Tell attendant, would you, if in that example that Bernie just gave, would you accept a 98% chance of no revision to not have to have the harvest mobility, having your something or tell attendant harvest versus a 99% success rate of um, having to harvest it? 98 versus 99, I take the 98% chance it's going to work and not have that big scar and the pain and the harvest mobility. So, again, you have to look a little deeper. So, uh, that's a good point. So a take home for people, allografts for ACL reconstruction in an older, less active patient that's not processed, it, it's not a bad graft. It's, you, you shouldn't walk away from here saying they shouldn't be used. That's not, that's not fair. Yeah. Uh, did you, uh, one of the questions I had was when you talk about return to play, do you guys standardize, when you say, how do you decide return to play therapist says, okay, it looks like they, were you doing standardized assessments uh, of balance of, you know, muscular strength versus the contralateral side and, if so, were you requiring all the centers to be the same types of assessments? And, and you know, in other words, how standardized did you make your protocols? Or were you just basically recording what was done yeah. and agreeing to be with our framework? So a lot of that data was collected in the 2000s, the aughts, you know, and, and there the, the standardized you no know, return to play a check mark. They, they weren't that they weren't out there. Not, not like they've been the last 10 years. So no, we didn't have that. So all this data does, the more you think about look into it, it's being amplified here. It just lays the groundwork for more questions and more robust data collection in the future. You just want to keep growing on it. It's just like that curve, the first curve, we're all excited about auto versus aloe. All of a sudden, we worked and also the aloe, I mean, the uh, auto started to split. Then you're going to say, well, what about the quad tendon? The fastest growing uh, popular graft in ACL surgery now is a quad tendon. 
we haven't even looked at quad tenant. So, you know, you just, it, it's a never ending process. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk about your kidding, uh, really useful track of data. Um, we also showed uh, that hyper laxity is something increased after primary ACL to construction. Um, are you guys performing kind of LDPs during yeah. the primary series and for which exactly? You know, that's, uh, Alan get good uh, stability studies show that, and the moon data showed that that if you have a high um, hyper laxity, uh, weaker bottom of the knee and the elbow, and a, a high pivot, they had a retail rate to then you know, get good stability study multi site in Europe, North America, uh, show the same thing that the, those patients have a higher retail rate and benefit from an LAT. So, yes, now we're doing more LATs, which moves to your point. In today's world, we're making a concession. Do you add a lateral extra ticular thesis or a DLL reconstruction to your primary? What does Moon say about that? Well, we haven't looked at that, you know. So by the time you collect the data, time you analyze it, clinical care has moved on. So you're always a little bit behind. Yeah. So uh, medial in this case seems to be a factor, but a lateral not. Have you looked at the group uh, related to the alignment of the lower extremity? So limb alignment uh, was not part of our um, analysis either, although in our nested cohort, we might look at that because we have standing long leg films on those. We're looking at joint space and, and bars. But to go back to that meniscus, I'm kind of scratching my head on that. We look at, you have no meniscus tear. You had a tear that was resected. You had a tear that was repaired. So those are the three categories in the moon database. On the medial side, a meniscus that was repaired looks the same as a meniscus that was resected. On the lateral side, a meniscus repair looks the same as a no tear, meaning the repair did what you wanted to do. The repaired tear uh, looked like a normal meniscus. That's not true in the meal side. The meal side, the uh, outcomes matched every, every sex. So you could say, well, a medial meniscus tear, according to the moon data, whether you repair it or resect it makes no difference. And, and superficially, that's the, that's the case. But and two, we still think protecting and saving meniscus is important. So we need to look into why there's something going on there. Maybe our, our uh, anyway, I don't want to speculate. We have a time. Yeah, we can probably, yeah. All right, I'm going to keep moving. So um, these next two talks, there's two separate ones. The non medical history. Uh, I think this is a Bernie Bach type of talk here. I think you're like this. And then the last talk is going to be definitely about uh, life. Okay, so what about? The history of cervical antisepsis. This talk is about the tale of Iggy and Joe. Two different surgeons, two different stories. They came to one endpoint, but had two different endings. All right, there's a life lesson in here. So, what, what are some of the burning questions that keep surgeons up at night? Are surgical gloves a romantic gesture? And who are James Greenlees and Jagab Pleczka? So. If you like Bernie, worry about these questions. I'm here for you. So let's go back to the mid 1800s. The mid 1800s, surgery is really getting his legs under. It's really starting to take off. A lot of surgeons were attempting larger and larger surgeries. They understood anatomy more, and they're getting very aggressive at doing um, new surgeries in the mid 1800s. And often the surgery went pretty well. The surgeons were able to do what they wanted to do, but the patient would die. And most of the time, it they die from post-operative suppuration and fever. I had to look up suppuration. It's the formation of conversion to or discharge of pus. So not a good thing. In the mid 1800s, 12 to 20% of hospitalized women died in childbirth. Over 50% of open fractures resulted in amputation. And there's a 30 to 50% mortality for all surgeries. So pretty abysmal situation. So the surgeons are all excited about doing more and more surgery, but there was this issue of separation that was a uh, major problem. So all through the Middle Ages, there was no germ theory. It was all about miasma. Miasma is about uh, a pestilence or a disease could be spread by bad air. And we're going to come back to that. So we introduced Ignis Semmelweis. So Iggy was a Hungarian physician who was described as being very diligent, very sincere, very intense. And he worked at the Vienna General Hospital in the 1840s and 50s. And he worked in the obstetrics clinics. At the Vienna General Hospital, the obstetric clinics in January of 46 reported 45 deaths out of three, um, 35, 13%. And the very next month, they reported 18%, January, February of 46. This is their hospital uh, statistics. They died from childbed fever. So in the Vienna Hospital, the obstetrics ward had two different clinics. 
One was a doctor's clinic in which 11% of the mothers died. And there was a midwife's clinic, which 3% of the mothers died. And then there's some data that showed the home births, less than 1% of the mothers died. Clearly, the public sensed this and expected mothers would do all they could to avoid the doctor's clinic. In fact, they'd be, be initial labor. They'd still wait till they know the clock hit midnight and then they shifted from one clinic to the other. So the big question was why? So um, Iggy was a very intense, conscientious, very driven man. And he worked relentlessly to try to find an explanation of why they're having such a high uh, mortality in childbirth. But he could find no explanation. And his obsession with trying to find the uh, explanation led to frustration, anger, exhaustion. And he had a nervous breakdown. And he was sent to Venice to recover in 1847. So an observation, in, of the two clinics, the physicians studied in the cadaveric lab before they went to the clinic and the midwives did not. All right, so Ignis, he recovered in Venice. He returned to Vienna and he had one close friend, Jagup Kolechka. He returned after recovering from his nervous breakdown to find that his close friend had died. This devastated um, Iggy. So he was determined to investigate being a very obsessive guy why did my friend die? And he died from complications from a cut from a cadaveric dissection knife. So now Ignis's depression turned into excitement because Kolechka's symptoms were identical to childbed fever. And he had an aha moment, a revolutionary concept. Kolechka and the mothers both died from, he called it, cadaveric particle contamination. This is huge for him to make that observation. Revolutionary concept. Childbed fever was not spontaneous, didn't come out of the air, but as a result of particle transmission. So you should be winning a Nobel Prize for this, right? So in May of 47, he instituted strict hand-washing guidelines, coordinated climb, uh, I'm sorry, lime, soap, and water. Here's a painting of Ignis overseeing hand-washing in the obstetrics clinic. So in April of 47, they had an 18% death rate. In May, he instituted strict hand washing guidelines. And in June, he only had six deaths, 2%. And less than a year later, they were down to zero deaths. First shattering change, right? I have a thing you'd like to hear about. Great success. Superhero, right? Everyone loves him. Nope. He was rigid. Preachy, if anyone questioned him, he'd fly into rages, he would berate people. He was not liked. He was viewed as troublesome. He was actually let go. He was fired because of his attitude. So in 1850, he returned to Budapest because he just got let go from Vienna. He was able to reproduce his good results in the first obstetrics clinic that he worked, but not in the second. The fact that he couldn't reproduce the results in the second led those his critics that people didn't like him. They really jumped on him. Yeah, he's a quack. It didn't work. See, he doesn't do this. They gave him a really hard time. He looked into why it wouldn't work on the second clinic, and there was a huge laundry fraud. The linens that were supposed to be cleaned and brought back, the company would take them, fold them, and bring them back. They wouldn't clean them. So it was all dirty linens. And so the matter was spread by dirty sheets. He figured this out, and he said, well, that's why it didn't work. That my, my theory of matter it's still legit, but it was too late. They're all, they were dismissing him. He's a, he's a jerk. He's a, not a nice guy. So he was done in by the laundry fraud. In, 19, in 1860, he wrote a book, The Etiology Concept of Prophylaxis of Childbed Fever, 1860. This is before the American Civil War. This was, could have been a huge, impactful book. But it was very poorly written. It rambled. It was very vitriolic. He was lashing out at his critics and his enemies. Um, and he's starting to have another nervous breakdown. You know, if you read it, obviously it's someone in declining mental health. So uh, Iggy went back to visit a friend in Vienna and his friend says, hey, Iggy, I want to show you this uh, new hospital we have here, the Lower Austrian Mental Home. Why don't you come with me? I want to show you this new hospital. So they took Iggy and this was a ruse. When Iggy showed up at the um, mental institution, he was restrained and forcibly admitted to the mental hospital. When he was forcefully admitted, there was a scuffle and he was cut. And you can guess what happened. 
he got septic and died from separation from a cut in the scalpel beam. So let's take a detour here now to Louis Pasteur. We're going to come back to Iggy. Louis Pasteur, French chemist, 1862, established germ theory and disproved spontaneous generation. This was 15 years after Semmelweis proved the benefits of cleansing to not transmit infectious particles. That was two years after he wrote his book about the same thing. Pasteurization, named after Louis Pasteur's use of heat to sterilize, usually just under um, um, boiling, still widely used today in these products. So a famous quote from Louis Pasteur, officially I re recommend pasteurization of milk, but I still love drinking it straight from the udder. All right, now we introduce Joe, Joe Lister. So he was born to Quaker parents in London. His father invented the achromatic microscope lens. They used these microscopes to study, study separations, trying to find what this material particle was causing all the problems. He was a surgeon, University of Glasgow, and he wrote this book and there was an orthopedic lament. Quote, the frequency of disastrous consequences of compound fracture contrasted with the complete immunity from danger to life and limb of a simple fracture. It is one of the most striking as well as melancholy facts in surgical practice. So if you showed up with open fracture, you know, um, loss of limb and life was common. So in 64, he studied cause and prevention of separation. He read works by uh, Pasteur. He also reviewed the work by Semmelweis, Iggy. So Pasteur claimed there are three methods to sterilize something. Uh, it was either filtration, heat, or chemical substance. And Joe Lister chose to pursue chemical substance to sterilize. So he spent years and years looking for the ideal antiseptic, something that would kill germs, but was not overly caustic to the wound. He's intrigued by the use of carbolic acid in the city of Carlisle. The city of Carlisle used carbonic uh, uh, on sewage and was made from coal tar. So uh, Carlisle, if they put a small amount of carbolic acid into the sewage, it eliminated the odor from the sewage and the cattle were healthier around the sewage area. So the odor of sewage and rotting flesh is similar. So Lister said, hey, maybe I'll try it. Sewage, rotting flesh, separation, carbolic acid, healthy cows, I'll give it a go. <clears throat> All right, another detour to miasma. So he noted the odor of sewage and rotting flesh is similar. That's a great line to write. Um, so miasma is the concept that bad air causes disease. It was a theory from ancient Greece. Hippocrates said bad air could cause any pestilence Hence the emphasis on clean air. You know, for centuries, TB or consumption, you were treating it by moving it to sunny, clean air, right? Um, uh, clean air was important. So this concept of washing your hands was silly. What are you talking about? It's not your hands, it's in the air. Why would you wash your hands when the uh, source of this uh, pestilence is in the air? So the prevailing theory, it was the prevailing theory for fear and separation from ancient Greece to the, till the 19th century until uh, Louis Pasteur was recognized. So this is almost 2,000 years people believed in um, bad air. So Lister, even though he's a disciple of Pasteur, he still felt that something that cleaned bad air, like carbolic acid, it had an appeal. So let's go back to our story. James Greenlease. So during, James Greenlease was an 11-year-old boy who on August 12th of 1865 was rolled over by a cart, had an open tibia fracture, was taken to the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. And there's reports that Lister was dismayed by seeing this cute 11 year old boy with the open tibia, knowing that he's probably gonna have an amputation, this little boy's gonna lose his leg. So Lister's, you know, didn't feel good about it. That's what a lot of surgeons did were amputations. Uh, but Lister decided to dress the wound in carbolic acid. So he, he dressed the open tibia carbolic acid and he was shocked at the day four and day nine dressing changes that there was no pus and the wound had actually healed. So this is the first documented case of treatment of an open fracture with an active antiseptic and it was in 1865. And when I keep seeing this date, we were talking last night about Gettysburg. <clears throat> this is the end of the American Civil War. You know, thousands of amputations were done in the Civil War because any open fracture was treated as amputation. That was just a treatment. And I always wonder if this had been just discovered five years earlier, how many amputations could have been avoided, you know, in just the American Civil War. So in March of 67, he published the results of Lancet, a new antiseptic technique. Only one of nine open fractures died, and this death was not from separation. <clears throat> so he, uh, Joe Lister settled on carbolic acid, 
uh, as his first antiseptic. In 69, he uh, developed these carbolizers. They were spray mist. And they would spray this mist on the surgical wound and the surgical team. So everyone, the hands, the arms, the wound, someone during the surgery was constantly spraying this carbolic acid um, on them. This carbolizer was not widely accepted in Europe until like nine, eight, nine years later. So eight, nine years later, Joe Lister was being resisted and people were saying it doesn't work and people did not believe him. And it was another two years before the rest of the world accepted it. Uh, Sir Thomas Clifford Allbutt quoted, Lister saw the vast importance of the discoveries of Pasteur. He saw it because he was watching on the heights and he was watching alone. So again, Iggy's not giving any, any credit. But Joe Lister, magnanimous, said, you know, listen, without some of ice, my achievements would be nothing. But the rest of the world was not recognizing um, uh, some of ice. They were all focusing on Lister. But it was gracious of Lister to say some of ice gave me a lot of ideas when I did. So Lister's legacy, he's known as the father of modern, modern medicine. His antiseptic program was eventually university accepted. He was knighted by the Queen Victoria, got the Order of Merit, and he was a privy counsel to the Queen. Iglevice, after his death, was uh, given the title of savior of mothers. But he tried for 15 years to have his antiseptic technique accepted. He was ridiculed and rejected by his colleagues. He had a nervous breakdown, had forced hospitalization, and died in an asylum from sepsis at 847. So they both studied, developed, and advocated anti-infection techniques. Many concepts and guidelines are still in use. But one went to great personal fame and accolade, the other to despair, anguish, and tragedy. So the Joe Lister story continues. In 76, Lister had two good American friends, Joe Lawrence and uh, Robert Wood Johnson. Robert Wood Johnson founded J&J, &J, who sold sterile uh, first aid um, supplies. Joe Lawrence developed an antisepsis solution for surgery and wounds. It was an alcohol-based antiseptic uh, for surgically wounds, later pitched as a floor cleaner and a cure for um, gonorrhea. But it was also marketed to dentists for or oral care. And you know what that product was? He named it after his good friend, Joe Lister, who was Listerine. So William Halstead was the founder of John Hopkins Hospital, one of the founders, prominent surgery. He established the very first surgical residency uh, in the country, and he followed Lister's lead. He used carbolic acid and mercuric chloride in the operating room. But these are so irritating and noxious that they, um, they forced him to move his OR to the outdoors because they were so uh, noxious uh, chemicals. And Caroline Hampton comes in. So Caroline was Halstead's favorite OR nurse, but she developed contact dermatitis from the um, uh, antiseptic spray. They didn't wear gloves and they had the spray being sprayed on during the surgery. And she had a contact dermatitis and Halstead couldn't bear to see her suffer. So he contacted Goodyear Rubber Company for an experimental pair of thin rubber gloves, never been made before. So in January of 1889, Halstead presented her with two pairs of rubber gloves made from plaster casts of her hand by a Goodyear company. Married six months later. That's all it takes, Bernie, a good pair of gloves. So these work gloves work so well that soon, most of the staff were using unsterile gloves. They were wearing gloves to protect their hands from the carbolic acid. That's why the surgeons wore gloves. Halstead then said, you know what? We probably should sterilize the gloves. And he was the first surgeon to wear gloves to protect the patient. So initially there were no gloves and they wore gloves to protect themselves from carbolic acid. Then they said, we need to sterilize these to protect the patient. So Jakob Koletska, he lit the bulb for Iggy. The childbirth fever was from organic particle contamination. That's who Jakob Koletska is. James Greenleaf allowed Joe to see that an antiseptic could stop separation and allow healing. And Halstead demonstrated the romance of surgical gloves. So Iggy and Joe are contrasting styles. Neither was accepted immediately, both faced resistance. But how you deal with adversity matters. You can deal with grace and persistence, or you can have anger and tirades. So think about that. Now, last talk, I'm going to go through this. I was asked to give a talk that was non-medical and about life. And as I was thinking about um, life, something struck me is that you know, life is busy, right? It's too busy. Everyone in this room has felt overwhelmed uh, by activities that require all your attention, right? We all uh, have to deal with this proverbial life uh, inbox that's always refilling and overflowing with demands, requests, and requirements of our time and energy. Uh, we're so busy on this treadmill of life that we really have time uh, for reflection. 
Well, every now and then, life gives you events. We had the opportunity to hit that red stop button on the treadmill and reflect on your life. And when I was putting this talk together, I recently had two of those type of events. One was the passing of my parents. And you know, losing your parents is never easy. Those in your room have been through it, know what I'm talking about. And I personally think the passing of one's parents is one of life's sentinel moments. I can't imagine whether you're close to your parents or not, that when you lose your parents, that doesn't cause a significant pause for introspection, right? This is one of life's landmarks. And the second such event was the birth of my grandson. My son had a son. That kind of blew my mind. And the first couple of times I held my grandson was a much more powerful moment than I would have anticipated. So you can imagine how the juxtaposition of these two events you know, led to a, very, a great appreciation for me for the circle of life, that life is precious and our time is short. So as I was pondering some of these ideas, obviously the next thing that comes to mind is, okay, if life is short, life is precious, how do I maximize this gift of life that I have? So I was kind of pondering this a little bit and thinking, well, how do I, what do we do with this? And then this concept of work-life balance, I was hearing people talk about it, it kind of caught my attention because it seemed like a noble cause. It's kind of seemed appropriate to what I was thinking about. So I'd hear people say things like, I don't want to work too much. I want to enjoy my life. I want to live my life and not just work. He works a lot. He has no life. Okay, Work-life balance, what exactly is this thing? And how does it apply to me? How does it apply to us in, in orthopedics? And I'm going to reference the sports medicine journey, but I think the concept's true for anyone in orthopedics here. So the concept of work-life balance seems to imply that work is this unfulfilling, tedious task. And life is full of rewarding and meaningful interaction. And that there's tension between these two. So is work, is it defined for, by that for which we get paid? Is it always negative? Is life everything else? Is life always rewarding? Is work distinct from life? So if so, if the answer to these questions is all yes, well, then our answer is pretty easy. Don't work, right? Problem solved. Well, that didn't seem to be the right answer for us, right? No one in this room wants to be this guy. So the more I thought about it, the less I like the term work-life balance. It didn't reconcile with my personal experience. It didn't seem to apply to me. What is work? What is life? Is there a clear distinction? Is one a necessary empty chore? Is the other all blissful happiness and reward? So people say, Chris, you need to stop working so much. You need to play some more golf. And I think, yeah, I like to golf. But I said, is playing golf more rewarding than having a great patient? You know, am I better off in my life playing golf or do I get more reward out of my life having a great patient? So I have nothing against golf, but you know, I get great satisfaction in mentoring and advising young people. I get a great sense of contribution when any research I'm involved in impacts clinical care. I enjoy seeing any program that I'm affiliated with grow and get better. Um, these all appear to be work related, but they're a source of great personal reward. So I had this revelation. I, I think we've been blessed. Our vocation is not a negative, unrewarding, soul draining ordeal that we required to do just to live. So that's a real blessing. And for the most part, I enjoy most of what I do, quote, for a living. So i advising patients clinic, building a program, doing surgery, covering athletic teams. Uh, and what's more rewarding than a heartfelt thank you from one of your patients? So I believe that every human being seeks social interaction and relevance, right? Who wants to be isolated and irrelevant? So any job or any vocation that makes you feel isolated and irrelevant, that is a soul and spirit draining um, uh, vocation. But fortunately, ours is the opposite. We have lots of opportunity to interact and be relevant and make an impact. So this distinction between work and life seems to blur in my mind. Is covering your child's high school football game, is that work or is that life? You know, it, it's, you know, it starts to seem almost kind of silly and arbitrary. Uh, my wife and I, fortunately, years ago, had the opportunity to do a two-month medical service trip to Zorzor, Liberia. Fabulous experience. Obviously work-related, but obviously had a huge impact from the life side of things as well. And Wayne Woodrow Hayes had this famous quote, you cannot always pay back to those who helped you in the past, but you can always pay forward to the current and future generation. When I think about that, it kind of reminds me of our experience in Liberia where the work-life distinction blurred and, and I can't distinguish between them. 
So if this work-life concept doesn't work for us, yet there is something there, right? Everyone in this room, you feel the tension. There's something going on here, but it's not really this traditional work-life concept. So what is it? Well, I think our dynamic is different. We don't have unfulfilling, tedious work, and part of it is, but for the most part, it can be very rewarding and uh, meaningful. So instead of work subtracting from our total life reward, work can add to our total reward. So instead of having this tension between a, a positive and a negative, we actually have two positives. But then again, I'm not sure I like the terms work and life. I don't like those terms. I'm gonna suggest that we change those terms to professional and personal both of which can give you satisfaction and reward. So now we have to work, our dynamic is dealing with this ratio of a professional reward and personal reward, because our total life rewards the sum of our professional and personal. And professional reward can be extrinsic, it can be things like financial, national, local reputation, your career advancement, getting awards and recognition. It can be intrinsic, such as having a grateful patient, having a mentee, mentee say thank you or the internal satisfaction of driving home after a day's work and knowing, hey, I helped a patient today. I had a well-done surgery. I did some relevant research. I helped my program grow. I helped advance the field of orthopedics. So there's professional rewards. I get asked, Dr. Kading, what do you enjoy most about your job? And I get asked that and I realized, you know, I have a very multifaceted job. I'm involved in clinical care. I'm involved with athletic teams, I involve local organizations. I do some consulting, I do some product development. <clears throat> I'm involved in national societies and some administration. I do some teaching. I'm involved in some programmatic growth. Uh, I'm involved in some research and I do some fundraising. And I enjoy all those things. The fact that I have a multifaceted professional career is what I really enjoy. So orthopedic sports medicine is not unidimensional, has multiple aspects. We just talked about dimensions on which you can focus and find rewarding. But there's even better news. There's lots of different facets, right? But you don't have to pick just one. Not only do you not have to pick just one of those facets to find reward, your selections and choices can evolve and change over your career. You're not locked into one. So is this too good to be true? Well, of course, there are challenges. So as I've gotten older, I've become a big yin-yang guy. I'm convinced every benefit comes with a cost. You think of something good that's happened in your life, there's always some cost to that benefit. <clears throat> and our vocation is a huge benefit, so there's gonna be some challenges. First challenge, we have endless opportunities for professional fulfillment. That slide I showed all the things I'm involved in, you know, that, holy cow, that's endless how much time you can put into it. So these professional fulfillment efforts can overwhelm our personal efforts. So this black hole of having professional fun and rewarding activities, it can take all our time and energy from our personal side and can take it away from our friends, our family, and our own personal health and wellness. So for me, orthopedic sports medicine can be like the uh, mythical Greek siren. It can lure you into a tragedy. And I'm sure everyone's kind of felt this. You kind of love your work and when you're in your work, it keeps pulling you in. And when you get a chance to step away, you realize, whoo, I'm just spending a lot of time doing my professional activity. Challenge two is this concept I call the positive feedback loop trap. The more you give, the more you get. The more you get, the more you want to give. So this is true as a team physician. It's true uh, in community involvement and in your clinical practice. So the converse of that is dabbling, right? You can't, dabbling doesn't work either. So you, you put too much in, you get sucked in, but if you just dabble, can you dabble? I'm gonna do some research. I'm gonna spend one or two hours a month doing some kind of research. I want to be a team physician. I'm going to swing by the training room once a month and see how the team's doing. I, I want to be a surgeon. I'm going to do one or two surgeries a month. No, personal health. I'm going to start exercising once a month. I'm going to spend some time with my kids once a month. So you just can't dabble in it. That doesn't work either. So you can't dabble, but you've got this um, positive feedback loop issue too. <clears throat> the more you do on one side, the more rewarding it is, but the less you have for the other side. We've got a little bit of a zero sum game here. <clears throat> so big challenge. <clears throat> Not easy to optimize these two and positive feedback loops don't lend to equilibrium. So it does not naturally find an equilibrium. You have to wrestle with this. <clears throat> it's easy for this professional feedback loop to just overwhelm and uh, you know, kind of blow up your personal side. <clears throat> so we only have so much time and effort on this earth. We must be very thoughtful on how we expend it between our professional and personal lives. We need an active assessment of the time effort ratio between our professional and personal lives. 
There's no clear answer or clear result. In fact, I don't think there is a answer. I think the answer is a process, not a result. I think we need to intimately take a hard stop in our lives and perform a purposeful assessment of our effort ratio between our professional and personal lives. It has to be a hard stop. It's not. <clears throat> hey, I was driving to work this morning. I stopped at the red light. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to do a little more of this. Nah, that's not a deep, hard stop. And it needs to be intermittent because life changes, right? Your situation on either side, professional and personal, can change. And the reward we seek can change. And have I changed my stage of life? So there's more traps. You know, um, I'm too busy to think about it. I'll get to it tomorrow. I'm a momentum rider. You know what? I'm a pretty good spot right now. I kind of like my life. And what I've done the last 10 years, I'm going to do the next 10 years because it's just momentum. I'm just going to keep doing the same thing. I, I think that's a mistake. Or you may be following external guidance. Someone else, your neighbor, your parents, your friends, someone's telling you, oh, you ought to be doing this. And you're following them telling you how to expend your time and energy. And I think that's a mistake. It has to be internal. And you fail to recognize that every benefit has a cost. And then there's hubris. That's one of my, um, that's one of my favorites here. Hubris is excessive pride or self-confidence. Sounds like an orthopedic surgeon, right? I can manage this. I'm too smart and capable. It won't happen to me. It only happens to others. Yeah, yeah, I know about that stuff, but I, I'm doing fine. Hubris has been the demise of many a soul. So I think this thing plays. This is the next slide. This is a video that one of our PhD researchers made. And I, I kind of like it because it shows that uh, life isn't always glamorous and humility is always just around the corner. So, well, I'm sitting there and I'm caught between the bench and the wall. It's like this 18 inch gap. I'm looking up, I see my feet and I see the sky and I can't get up. It's all embarrassing sitting here and there are fans right there and the fans reach over and, dude, man, you got blown up, man. And I, well, I get there and they're all watching the game, you know, anyway. So anyway, it's not always glamorous and humility is always right around the corner. But we've been given a great gift, but with that gift is some hidden cost. So I think we recognize, we need to recognize we got a great gift and it has a cost. We have to be grateful for the gift. I think we have to be purposeful in how to avoid some of those pitfalls and recognize and deal with the cost that we sometimes have to pay. So we want to balance our professional and um, personal um, lives. I'm going to propose a six step plan, all right? Step one, find your professional reward opportunities, all right? There's, there's some drudgery to what we do, but find those parts of being um, your professional job that will make it more interesting, rewarding, stimulating, and fulfilling, all right? So there's lots of things you can get involved in, right? And so think about those in your particular situation and which ones will make your profession, professional work more rewarding. It's been shown that when we're younger in our careers, we tend to focus on attaining and acquiring. We want to attain, acquire money, reputation, professional advancement. But as we age, our goals tend to focus, change to more to relationships. We want to give back, we want to make a difference, we want to leave a legacy. And I've definitely felt that dynamic. So recognize that this is probably an evolution that's going to happen in your career. That's why you don't want to be a momentum writer. You don't want to do the same. What you've done the last 10 years has led, led to success. You don't want to just automatically think that's what I should do for the next 10 years. So uh, be aware of that. We go through life and life changes. Step two, identify personal reward opportunities. Is it family, your personal hobbies, your enjoyment, your health, some kind of social organization, your church, is it friends? And recognize that your personal side will also evolve with time. Just look at your family, let alone your personal health. You can go from being single to married with children and empty nested and grandchildren. This may change what your priorities are on the uh, on personal side. So put some real thought into what are the opportunities 
and how do I want to prioritize my personal side? Step three, <clears throat> do a brutally honest assessment of what do you, not someone else, not what someone else is telling you, what, what you, know, you think somebody that makes someone else happy, what do you really want from your professional life? Don't let it be externally defined, not by your spouse, friends, family, teachers, peers. Just sit there and deep, you know, inside here, what do you want to get out of your career? <clears throat> and what are your personal life priorities? So what are your personal and professional life? And um, make an honest list of your personal and professional priorities, all right? Step four. So at the end of step three, you've got this large, ambitious, audacious list of priorities, right? Of course you do. This is, you're going to do it all. You've got it all in there. You've got 15 pounds of priorities that you're trying to stuff in a five pound sack of life. So you cannot do it all. So step four is recognize you can't do it all and recognize, can you fit your PMP priorities in a 24 hour day? I don't think so. You have to redo it, take your list, cut it down to where you can fit your time and energy capacity. And recognize that a gain here is a loss there. So not an easy process. So after step three, you've got two ambitious, two ambitious a list. Step four is to rethink it, cut it, and trim your list. <clears throat> step five is recognize that things will change. Your situation priorities will change, right? I just talked about that on both professional and personal side. Things are going to evolve. So you need to plan to make another hard stop, deep dive into what you really want in those two areas. So you have to repeat steps one through four intermittently. Step six, recognize it's not going to be perfect, all right? We don't live in a perfect world. Be satisfied that you were thoughtful and proactive. And that's more than what 99% of other people do. So our six step summary. One, define your professional opportunities. Define your personal opportunities. Make a brutally honest list. Number two, tear it up and redo it. Trim the list. Five, recognize things will evolve. You're going to have to repeat, reevaluate intermittently steps one through four. And then accept it and be thankful. It's not going to be perfect, but you've gone through the process and that's more than most people do. All right, shift of gears. Now you're going to say, okay, how am I going to maximize? I got that six step plan, but how am I going to maximize my reward on both sides of this uh, equation? Well, far be for me to give you recommendations on the personal side, that's on you. But I do have a couple of comments on the professional. First is team, a group of people performing independent tasks to achieve a common goal. I'm a big team fan, we're all aware of teams. John Doan, a, a British cleric and poet said, no man's an island. None of us got to where we are without interacting with support of other people. And even Isaac Newton, who had incredibly innovative thoughts and said, if I've seen further, it's because I've stand on the shoulders of others. So embrace others in your professional journey, but working with other people is not easy. Building a team is a challenge. Building a high performing team is a huge challenge. So the challenges of a team, agendas. Does everyone in your team have the same agenda? Does everyone have the same level of commitment? How about personalities and complex human interaction? Don't underestimate the issue of giving credit. If your team's successful, who's gonna get credit for what's being done by the team? Skill sets the same, ego, self-explanatory. Does team members trust each other? How about the logistics of having, trying to be functional and, uh, functional and operating with uh, different organizations? Clarity of structure. Unless you have a clear structure and operating um, uh, agreement, you can descend into some chaos. Does everyone agree on the priorities of the team? So this is a lot. Don't be intimidated, but also don't be naive as you try to build your team. You can go solo. That's simple, fast, easy, less complex, but a team is more complex with much greater potential. So there's an African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So whether you want to try to climb a mountain, or you're trying to understand you know, elementary particles, you're going to need a big team to make it happen. Some quotes from people who've been successful. Great things happen in business are never done by one person, they're done by a team of people. Steve Jobs. Talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence wins championships. Michael Jordan. And then one of my favorites, teamwork is the fuel that allows common people to attain uncommon results. Andrew Carnegie. So a couple examples here, but uh, we got the AOSSM Council of Delegates to get 44 states to pass legislation. One person couldn't do that, but the Council of Delegates acting as a team made that happen. My home institution, we instituted a multidisciplinary team and allowed us to bring all these different disciplines together as one team. And uh, by having a successful personality and programs, we were able to leverage that into building our 
sports medicine dedicated uh, facility. Again, team. Moon, you've heard about. So these multi-center collaborations can be rewarding professionally, very rewarding, uh, powerful, meaning we've won, uh, we've won some awards and very impactful. A lot of uh, publications have come out of this, uh, these collaborations. But it can also be, these most collaborations can also be very personally rewarding. You have lifelong friendships and uh, trusted uh, colleagues that come out of this. But when you build a team, beware of the traps. You need to be crystal clear on objectives. Um, in your objectives need to be very clear. That way you get a meaningful goal or a meaningful research question. And um, you need to get buy-in for all the members. That, and then you're not gonna get buy-in unless they all understand what the objective is. And then understanding your objective will drive the size and processes of your team. Be thoughtful of size. Increased size is increased complexity. If you're too small to reach your goal, you're going to be ineffective. If you're too large, you may not reach your goal either because uh, the complexity of a uh, too large a team. You want to be, um, you know, beware of the clash of a complex human interaction, personalities, cultures, bureaucracy. Maintaining a team, a team is tough enough if you, without taking these into consideration. So if you're an Einstein, Aristotle, or Shakespeare, maybe you can go it alone. But if you're like the rest of us. I think you need to find a team. That's my recommendation. Find a team with common vision, common values, teammates you respect, and you value the same goals. A corollary team is a mentorship. And you're all pretty familiar with mentorship. And, and I'd be remiss if I was to discuss mentorship in a meeting and not recognize John Bergfeld, a mentor of mine. So Larry Sin, um, he wrote a book uh, about teams. He talks about the mood elevator. Those in red are negative moods and the blue are uh, positive moods. And obviously being grateful is considered the most positive mood to have. And he claims, and I believe you can, to a large extent, you can choose the mood you want to have. So choose to be grateful. So we need to be thankful. Medicine is becoming more challenging, but it's still a better job than 99% of the people in the world have. So you can't forget your home team, your family. That's the foundation for everything that we do. And in our sports medicine journey, be thankful, embrace it. And I have three uh, comments. One, be thoughtful and proactive as you go through your journey. Find your personal professional balance the best you can. Do what you can to minimize or avoid those traps that we outlined. Number two, don't go on the journey alone. Find a team. Not easy. It's got its own traps and challenges, but it'd be much more rewarding. Number th um, three, find a mentor and encourage you to be a mentor. So the sportsman drills a living, dynamic, evolving process. I encourage you to enjoy the ride. <clears throat> And last comment, remember, it's later than you think. Thank you. Chris, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming, be our visiting professor. We've got a little uh, gift here for you, a few things. We've got a, a lovely uh, UVA tie. <laughs> Thank and you. A hat. Beautiful. Maybe an ortho and a certificate. Oh. We get a, if uh, any of the sports guys are left here, and the fellows will get a picture up here at the end. But uh, thank you very much for coming. I know a lot of people get off the OR and stuff, but yeah. this has been great. Thanks. I, I know I ran over.